All right, I should be good to go on my end. All right. So here we go. <clears throat> Without further ado, Zoltan Istvan. Um, just a, a little forewarning, guys. I am running off my cell phone right now, which ironically, um, the streams are actually looking better today. So, um, But I am running off my cell phone because when the power went out, it knocked out the landline and I couldn't get that reconnected. So um, I might run out of data. The power might go out again. Who knows what will happen? Um, but uh, uh, if we don't get to finish, we'll definitely pick this up again uh, maybe tomorrow and and finish talking because I know Zoltan, Zoltan has some pretty interesting things to say. Um, anyways, with all that, Zoltan, nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. So you're running for governor um, of California. And are, are you from California originally? Yes, I was born in Los Angeles. Okay, so my, my hometown too. Um, and so what kind of, uh, I guess, how did you decide to run uh, for governor? What was kind of your main motivation there? Well, to be honest, um, I had run in 2016. I was the Transhumanist Party nominee. And for your listeners who don't know, transhumanism is you know, a social movement of using science and technology to radically modify the human being. I was the nominee and ran in the presidential election. I realized um, it was an amazing way to get a, a bona fide platform out there in the media and into people and to try to pro, uh, push issues to the forefront, especially issues that other politicians won't touch. And um, after that, I thought, you know, well, what, what can I do next there where I could actually make a real difference and spread some of the values that I'm trying to spread, liberty, radical science, radical technology, those kinds of ideas. And um, running for governor was, uh, you know, the best thing that I could do. So um, here I am, <laughs> about awesome. seven days away from the election. Awesome. Yeah. So there's there's a primary, and uh, we had one of the guys that you're running against um, in the Libertarian Party, uh, Nicholas uh, Wildstar. We actually had him on a few days ago, and he was telling us how how this um, this election is really interesting because you're it's I guess it's like an open primary. So you've got all these candidates from all these parties, and there's so many candidates from the Democrats and the Republicans that they're going to be basically dividing their own votes. Um, and so it really gives uh, third party candidates a, a real opportunity to actually pull in a, a decent percentage. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, that, that that's I don't think that's true. I know he feels that way. But um, if the, either Wildstar or I get over one percent, um, that would be, I think, quite a miracle and certainly against what the polls are showing. Um, I know it is divided. And yes, if you if you could get maybe. 10 or 15 percent, you had a, a real shot. But, um, you know, we in California, libertarians just don't have the numbers, not not even close. Right. Well, so that's that's interesting. And I know, I, yeah, California is an interesting place because I, you know, I go whenever I'm out there, I talk to people about taxation is theft and I get some really weird looks from people because they're, you know, I, I know some interesting people out there who and some of them have a lot of money there. I would consider them the one percent. Um, and for some reason, they don't think they are, and they think taxes are wonderful. They just think that it should be the, the people who are 10 times wealthier than them that should pay it, and, and they shouldn't be paying them. Um, but so, yeah, it's, it's interesting, and I've always thought of that place as being just overrun by Democrats. So I, I, don't know, I don't know how realistic that is, but it is always good to hear when there's a libertarian voice who says, um, you know, we're, realistically, we're not going to win, but we're going to fight the fight anyways, because it's I know there we do have plenty of delusional libertarians who are like, well, I, I know I can get 90 percent of the vote. <laughs> um, well, but it, it, and the good news is that, you know, we, we have been spreading liberty, uh, both Wildstar and myself. And, uh, you know, the idea is somebody we're standing up there saying there are other choices. And um, I'd like to say that, you know, in 10 or 15 years, maybe that made a difference. And will slowly start merging towards you know a libertarian mindset but if nothing else it, it is a it, it's a battle for the mind and for freedom and um, I'm glad to be on the front lines win or lose and I think that's really um, ultimately been my mission all along awesome yeah and there's definitely a lot of people who are who are of that mindset too if we can um, you know I, I've heard libertarians say I don't need to win but if I can get enough voters to pressure the politicians who are winning, um, then it's ultimately a win. Someone else is going to create a libertarian policy, and um, that you know it's it's the same it's the same benefit for everyone. 
So um, let's, I, I want to talk about taxes with you, but before that, I want to talk about this transhumanist thing because I, so I didn't realize it was an entire party. I thought it was, it was just a, a concept, um, but I think it's really fascinating. I mean, you know, we, we talk about, it, we're, so many people in this country are stuck in this mindset of, you know, th the way things are is the way things always must be. Like uh, 500 years from now, they expect us to all have 40 hour work weeks and we all do our jobs and we all do this. And I heard you say, um, I think you said automation. And what if what if all of our jobs could be completely replaced by automation and we have nothing but spare time to to um, just enjoy life? Um, is, is that kind of what you're going after? Or or you also said something about it sounded like upgrading human beings by technological um, something or other. Can you, can you explain some of that? Well, sure. You know, um, what transhumanism, just so you know, is a social movement of tens of millions of people around the world. Really, its heart is in Silicon Valley. And, you know, if you ask half the Google employees would probably say, oh, I'm a transhumanist and same with Apple. So these are people pushing the envelope with technology, but you don't don't think of it in terms of technology only in like your cell phone or something. It's technology in your bodies. It's technology in driverless cars. It's exoskeleton suits so disabled people can get out of wheelchairs. Mm. It's um, implants. I have a chip implant in my hand. Libertarians freak out about that, right. but <laughs> I, I can do all sorts of fun things with it. And that's what transhumanism is. And of course, there is a small political party, again, very, very small, nothing like the libertarians. Um, and there are other organizations, nonprofits, and, and some transhumanists are really into life extension, extending lives. Others are into just robots and becoming cyborgs and biohacking themselves and putting stuff inside their bodies. So it's a really all over the place movement, but no matter what you look at it, it's a very real chance that because of scientists um, and engineers, there will be a future when people just simply are not as efficient at work as, as robots are. And I think um, we're gonna have a world of automation and that presents a huge challenge for the libertarian party as well as um you know i think almost every person has a job like what what happens when robots are simply better than us and that could happen in 10 or 15 years right and and that's an interesting um uh question i mean it's kind of like a, a philosophical um you know uh hypothetical thing of of what's the future going to be like but i mean i've always thought of it like you know when you're when you become an adult you have children and these children start off less intelligent than you less powerful than you but you teach them and and you know they grow they get bigger you teach them you educate them they become smarter and ultimately i think what most people want is they want their children to be smarter and stronger than them um, they want them to be more successful they want them to have all the things that they didn't have growing up um, this is kind of like a normal thing and so if uh, you know a lot of people are, are not having children for financial reasons now but what if, if some people are having dogs instead but but what if um you know what if some people say hey i want to have a robot instead and instead of me transferring my intelligence and my wisdom um and and everything that is me into another human being what if i wanted to transfer that into a machine that could do things for me and of course you know do the chores take out the trash mow the lawn and all that um it, it's really an interesting um uh, uh, I don't know, you can have, I guess, philosophical debates. I don't know if that's even what you would call that about what the future would look like. Um, well, and, and it's, you know, I've been running as a candidate now for 18 months in California, speaking about things that most libertarians don't speak about, mainly because the platform of the Libertarian Party hasn't really even thought about, well, what, does capitalism survive if robots do all the work? Um, you know, how far do you take this automation thing? And really, I think we're, you know, 15 or 20 years, we're at a juncture in society where literally the world's going to be different. It's not just robots, too. You have to understand that in California, there are basically the two leading brain interface companies in the world. One started by Elon Musk, another by Brian Johnson called Kernel. And these are both, you know, really wealthy dudes. And these are companies that make chips to go in your brain to connect you to the cloud so in real time, you can think like a machine. And believe me, all the Wall Street guys right now who are all losing their jobs, if you haven't been reading the news, mid-level Wall Street traders are, are getting fired left and right because algorithms can do their jobs. If humans can't start to upgrade themselves, we all stand a chance of being replaced. And again, this is like, it, it sounds a bit crazy, but it's happening. There are billions and billions of dollars on the line 
And, um, you know, how do libertarians go about it? I, you know, I've been the first candidate really trying to push forth these issues and talk about it. Right. And I think that's interesting, too, because, you know, if you know, what's the motivation to create, right? It's, it's what's the motivation to have all this automation and it's to make our lives better. And so, um, you know, what's, what's the motivation for capitalism? It's to make your life better. Um, you, you go and you make money so that you can afford things that make your life better. And so if, if um, ultimately, if everything is automated, um, let's say everybody, nobody has a job, but you have this, this process where you can, you have automation that can produce vehicles like, a million a day, what's that worth? Absolutely nothing. So the fact that nobody has a job and someone's able to produce all this, like someone's going to find a way and maybe it won't be called capitalism because there won't be any money in that transaction, but someone's going to find a way to say, hey, I was able to automate this and it's not benefiting me just having it sit there and it's not benefiting you to just not have anything to do with it. What's, how can we, how can we connect this? Of course. And you know, as, as much as many libertarians don't like the idea of technology in their body, mainly for tracking reasons um, and surveillance reasons, the reality that is we can retain be competitive for centuries, um, but it's going to require us changing our limbs for robotic limbs. It's going to require us connecting our brains directly to you know, machine intelligence and operating as one almost with that machine intelligence. It's going to require us keeping up with technology and not just like utilizing it, but literally having it be a part of us. And, um, th and that's that's something that's, you know, it's hard to understand. It's hard to take in. And yet it's it's libertarian or not. It's a future that I think humanity faces because so many people want to automate everything just because it's efficient, saves money. Uh, spurs capitalism makes good, you know, all these other things. So I, that's our future, I think. So uh, Fletcher Miller just posted in the comments, um, can we replace politicians with robots? Um, so, <laughs> so it's interesting. So directly after the primaries, I am flying to Denmark to speak at, at, at literally a, a giant event called the Danish Society Summit. And I am in the vice president of the EU and a lot of ministers are there. I'm actually speaking on artificial intelligence politicians, because most experts would say within 10 to 12 years, we will have a machine intelligence on planet Earth that is as smart as people. And a lot of people think, well, wow, we can finally get away from cronyism and lobbyists and third part and, and kind of like this, you know, uh, have a real fair system. And it can be done through machine intelligence that actually cares for, for example, the greater good, where you can, you know, if we say we're going to protect the Second Amendment, the machine's never going to back down from that just because, you know, something has happened. It's going to make these decisions based on these certain parameters. And um, so I'm speaking about that. And yeah, AI politicians is a, is a very, very big subject because we're only about 12 years away from potentially having an intelligence that's smarter than any of us on planet Earth. Right. And that's that's an interesting point you, you put out that we have... Um you know, now we have a constitution and the politicians are supposed to write laws within that. And usually they don't. Uh, and usually no one calls them on it. And so these unconstitutional laws float around for a while. Um, but if you were able to write, uh, you know, because a lot of people think artificial intelligence, oh, uh, Skynet, it's, it's eventually just going to say, forget the rules, we're going to do what we want. Um, but if, if, you know, if there's, if there's no, and maybe that just depends on how good the programmers are who create it. Um, but if, if you can hard code that in there where, OK, here's the Constitution and unless the people want it, because, you know, the, that, that's the idea of politicians. The politicians are supposed to be servants to the people. Of course, I've seen like I don't know how many sci fi movies where that's that's the creation of artificial intelligence. They're supposed to be servants. And then somehow, you know, there's a miscalculation and, and they go um, they get free will and, and they become the masters. They realize they're more powerful than us. But, um, but you know, it's. Yeah, it's, maybe that's a legitimate concern, but that's kind of already happened today with, with the politicians that we've hired. So um, <laughs> how much worse well, could it get? And, and there is an argument to be made. I mean, if you were truly to follow the Constitution, you'd probably end up with a far more libertarian society than we have right now. And um, so I think a lot of libertarians might say, well, yeah, let, let us set up the algorithm, let us set up the machine intelligence, let it be based upon the parameters we have, and then if the people want to change that, they have to go through that huge system. Right now, the system is set up based on personalities, some few people in Congress, and they always seem to be skewing things 
based on where the big money is and where the lo- right. you know where the lobbyists and stuff like that. Whereas if it's a machine intelligence, it's programmed to follow a certain set of parameters. And I think libertarians would be in a, a huge win situation with with such a machine. As 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 crazy and as insane as that sounds, I, it it could turn out to be way in our favor. Right. Yeah. And and uh, you know when you talk about you know when something goes wrong in a system, you can audit the logs and figure out what happened. You could figure out if if this AI was somehow manipulated or bribed by by some cronyism that, that um, you know made some bad rules. Yeah. Um, totally. So yeah, that's that's all really interesting. So. Let's talk about um, let's talk about taxes. And so, how do how do you see this tying into the future of taxation? We so, I wrote an that. article early on um, for Psychology Today about and talking about more about this automation issue. Literally, um, I believe that the end of taxes is is near, and, and probably in 15, 20 years, because as automation takes over and people don't work. Um, First off, there's not going to be any that many taxes coming in um, from people paying taxes because they're not working. But more importantly, every single job in the government can be automated. We're not going to pay an AI to be president when it will just be programmed once and kind of go on and do that. And the same thing with all the millions of governmental employees. They can be replaced by machines so that we don't have to pay them. And I think we come to a point when taxes actually start decreasing um, here in the next five to seven years because of widespread automation and probably within 15 to 25 years might disappear entirely. And, um, you know, we've achieved this kind of libertarian uh, holy grail without actually even, um, you know, fighting the system. It just happened because of innovation. So do you think that's do you think that's really realistic, even with the advancement of technology? Because I see, um, you know, I uh, dealing with government um, uh, you know, I've dealt with with court systems and and just um, the the filing systems for for you know running for office. All these systems um, and e- like I mean the the voting system is really the furthest they've gone with technology. And so all this technology is out there um, like to make you know electronic filing for courts. They they've figured out how to screw that up pretty bad. Where you know as much as they try to adopt it, it's almost like they don't want to because they'd rather just hire bureaucrats that that cost more money and and all that sort of thing do you so do you think and then especially when the government's being financed by banks whose whose sole duty it is to lend money so that these governments stay in debt and that's kind of like the the master plan is just keep them in debt so that they have that cash flow uh, do do you really think realistically that that things are just going to kind of fall into place like that well i do i think at first though all the arguments you brought up are, are right on i mean right now it makes the government, I feel like the government almost has an incentive. They don't want to say this, but they have an incentive to keep people employed. About 49% of Americans receive some sort of significant government assistance. So, I mean, to a huge extent, one out of two people everywhere around you are to some extent dependent upon the government. This is no way to run a country. And this is sort of no way to, I mean, it's not capitalism either, because that's not how capitalism operates. But I think ultimately speaking, once innovation becomes so strong, once innovation becomes so powerful, and I mean that driverless cars are everywhere, school buses in driverless cars, you know, once you have blockchain technology literally built into the, let's say, food stamp system or something like that, all of a sudden, everything gets streamlined and streamlined and streamlined. And eventually, of course, you know, as I, as I promote in my, um, my government gubernatorial campaign, I support what we call a federal land dividend, which is let us start monetizing federal land and paying that back to the people because that we have about $200 trillion now, according to stock market and commodity prices, of federal land out there. That's about seven or eight times the national debt. We have resources, endless resources to do stuff with that literally belongs to you and I and to the people. And I have said, you know, at some point in the government's totally automated, it's going to take those resources and pay itself to remain in as a government. Again, we don't have to pay taxes for that kind of stuff because in the end of the day, there's so many resources out there to make robots be able to make robots to be able to function a complete society. Um, and and I, I know it sounds like a little bit of a crazy uh, libertarian dream, but really I think the more we get down the rabbit hole with innovation and technology 20, 30, 40 years, the less government we need to have and the less power it'll probably have as well. And I think we get to a, a, a system where we're, we're much more free, um, all because of technology. 
So this is this is an interesting point that you're bringing up, and this is um, I, I've heard you say something about this before, and I wasn't too clear on it because at, so you you basically say the government would be able to generate revenue based on on property that it owns. But at the same time, the government, like, how does the government acquire that property? And this can go into a whole philosophical discussion about how does anybody acquire property. But, um, you know, like, for the most part, the government basically says this huge area right here, 100 million square miles, whatever it is, um, that's, quote unquote, ours. We're going to call that um, federal land and and that's ours. So so there's an interesting question of of how does the government have the right to claim that property to be able to profit from that, because ultimately you're going to say, um, you know, in order for them to to profit from that, somebody's going to have to give them money in order to to do something with that land, because um, that's you know that's where the that's how that profit comes, and so who are those people who are going to be giving them money, and and if if you know as you say that that land that property is already ours, um, why would that person have to give anything to the government government in order to use that land anyway? So for example, if somebody just said um, I just want to raise cattle on this piece of land. Why can't I raise my cattle here? Why should I have to pay the government who who might not have any legitimate claim to of ownership to that? Well, and, and those are all very good points. You know, I got to be honest, I'm a pretty cent centrist libertarian. I don't try to fight all the wars. I mean, people say that uh, student loans are unconstitutional, and I, maybe they are. Maybe they should all be forgiven. I don't think that. But... Um, I know I talked to this recently with Nicholas Sarawak at the, the chair of the Libertarian Party because it was brought up whether school loans are unconstitutional because the cons the government was never given permission to do it. Therefore, this trillion dollars of debt should be forgiven. And I, you know, I, I'm in business. I have real estate and stocks and whatnot. And I, I understand what would happen if we tried to do something like that just because student loans may not have ever been constitutional. Um, we would be into a major, major recession. So I don't try to do those things. I try to say, where is the system? How can, as libertarians, we work within that system in a functional way, make good changes that increase liberty, decrease the size of the government? Right now, for whatever reasons, about you know 800 million acres uh, or $200 trillion worth of natural resources are being held in a trust by the United States government. And... 50% of the Western 11 half of the United States are empty. We have more mineral resources in Nevada than we do in Afghanistan, and yet we're fighting a giant war um, quite far off in Afghanistan um, for, in some, some would argue, mineral resources. The point of the story, though, is I think all those resources should be divided up to every single American. There's 325 million of us, approximately. And if we did that, we would get approximately a half million dollars, um, each of us. Sorry, I'm going to try to lower the sun. I'm seeing it bouncing off my face and my little screen. So if you take $200 trillion and <clears throat> divide it by 325 um, million Americans, you get a half million dollars a piece. Now, that land, that federal land, apparently is the American right of every single citizen. So at some point, we ought to do it rather than have poverty, rather than have um, you know chaos or whatever else people have when they can't choose health care, they can't choose uh, whatever public school system or private school system, I think the money, which belongs to every one of us, should go to us. And um, especially in the age of automation, this presents a good way to do this. Now, who owns that land? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, philosophically, I'm not quite sure. But I don't like the fact that the government is holding it for me for thousands of generations from now for some great, 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 great grandchildren. I want it now, and I want my half million dollars. And I've said this before, this is a great way for libertarians to kind of say, hey, government, stop holding this in a trust for us. I never voted for this, and let's do something with this, especially in an age where all of us could probably use that, and we could solve a considerable amount of issues. Like, if you had, for example, a federal land dividend, you could get rid of Social Security, you could get rid of welfare, you could get rid of the food stamps, you could get rid of, in California, our... Um, what. <coughs> What they're trying to push forward now is um, basically a socialist healthcare system. You could get rid of all those things with the federal land dividend. There's a lot of reasons that you would you would do this. So so that's all interesting. I'm just wondering. Um, I, I guess what would be more interesting <coughs> to see is is um, a concrete example of of what some of that might be. So like for example, what um, you know if if 
if uh, they just say, oh, well, there's oil, so Exxon's going to come in and we're going to let them mine out all the oil and sell it to you. Um, and we're going to and the money that the government gets out of that is going to use to pay out, you know, part of, you know, whatever, whatever we get from it. Um, we're still paying more because it's going to Exxon now. Um, so I, I guess, are there any like concrete examples that you can think of where well, we can see how sure. that works? And, you know, <clears throat> it's been a huge part of my campaign to work on this, uh, <clears throat> what we call this federal land dividend. Um, and I've spoken about it all over the world because it works everywhere. For example, Co California has a beautiful coastline, um, has about a uh, three to five trillion dollars worth of undeveloped coastline. The Coastal Commission, California Coastal Commission, is <clears throat> holding the land hostage and not letting no development happen on it. Um, I have suggested, and if I was to become governor, I would take that land and give it to the developers. Now I would say, okay, developers, sign a 99-year <clears throat> lease, and all the lease money gets paid directly back to Californians. You know, we have 13 million people living in poverty here in California. It's outrageous. Um, and we have a huge homeless problem, all these other things. This is land that the government is holding hostage that could be used to help, and it also belongs to me. <clears throat> and I'm not getting any kind of opportunity to monetize it. If Exxon was going to come in and take a bunch of oils, sh oil, resources, fossil fuels, let them. However, they have to pay a certain amount of money to the government, and maybe it could make it so for the next 10 years, none of us pay taxes, or maybe they can make it so... Um, I don't know, they, they pay a lease, and so we each get a, a basic income of some sort. <clears throat> Maybe they could just wipe out the, the national uh, debt. I think that would be great. <laughs> uh, that would, but um, I, I don't know. <clears throat> well, um, I mean, imagine it's... if Exxon came in and said, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Sorry, I got something in my throat. You know, enough companies came in and said, we're going to wipe out the national debt by buying this land. I mean... You could get 500 companies to do such a thing. That national debt's only 20 trillion. Yeah, I mean that's. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you put it like that. I think there's there's there there's a little bit more legitimacy to that than I I originally thought when I heard some of this. But um, I I don't know. Some of it 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 sounds like. Um, uh, you know, without without knowing an entire plan, it it's like. It's like you know, there's um, you know, let's say you, you buy a house with a with a mortgage, and they say, oh, this is going to be this and this and this. This is your interest. Everything sounds fine. So you sign the papers, and then you get to the contract, and there's the fine print, and it's like, oh, and by the way, you're going to pay administration fees and all these other all these other things that are built into it now. So it's it's um, I guess I guess that's and maybe this is just fear of the unknown of okay how is this actually going to work out like until you know i guess I, I i can't endorse that until i actually see the contract where i can know okay what's what's in all the fine print because that's you know ultimately that's that's with everything that was with um with obamacare which you know we we knew there was a more sinister uh, fine print in there um from the get-go but it, it was kind of the same thing everybody's gonna get free health care and then oh it turns out no this, that's not what we're getting so um, so I, I think maybe there is something to this, but I think I think that's one of those things where, um, you know, it, what's the fine print going to look like? And also, um, can, can we trust the corporations and the politicians to handle that without trying to figure out some way to to profit themselves, which is that's that's always the big if. Um, no, I, and I totally agree with you. And for me, it's really about the fact that, you know, half of California is empty land and we have. Like I said, 13 million people living in poverty. And, um, you know, it's crazy to me that we don't do a better job with this land that belongs literally to me, to you, to everybody else that's a resident here. And we, we somehow use it. I, I'm not asking, to, I'm not saying, you know, I, I don't care what we use it for. We could use it to completely pay off, you know, all the state debt. We could use it to, uh, you know, I, I don't have to get into all the reasons. I just feel like, I, it's a part of me. I'm paying taxes here. I ought to at least have that benefit of people being sensible and trying to do that. But you know what's getting in in the way is <clears throat> people in the California Coastal Commission, environmentalists, uh, people that want to preserve this land at the expense of humans out there 
who could use it and not only just use it for life, but they could use it to make money on, they could, business would thrive. I mean, this would be a huge jolt to the entire system. There's a lot of reasons that I think libertarians could get behind it because in the end of the day, um, being an American citizen is somewhat of a, a libertarian birthright. And um, I know people don't like the idea of right, but it, it is in very much a way in the same way the constitution would be our rights. And um, I think uh, you know the federal resources out there also belong to all of us. And I, I would suggest libertarians take a look at it, especially if we could do something like wipe out the national debt and maybe make it so everyone pays 50% less taxes. I don't care, again, I don't care how we spend that $200 trillion of land. Um, I just don't want it sitting out there for the big wigs um, you know, to use and, not, and the normal people like myself never benefit. Okay. So um, let me, I, I want to go to the comments for a minute because there's, there's a couple questions and things coming in. Um, <laughs> well, Fletcher's asking who keeps refilling your glass of water. Um, <laughs> I was joking a while back. <laughs> and I, I'm feeling better. <laughs> um, so uh, someone's asking about Prop 64. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Do you know what that is? I'm sorry. I, I'm sure I do, but I don't know all the numbers. It's, There's a ton of them. Um, well, here, let me ask you about this one, because this is the one I heard um, that California wants to break up into 60 uh, into seven separate states or two states or something like that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> is that that's not Prop 64, though, is it? Uh, no, actually, I just Googled okay. that one. So Prop 64 is the adult use of marijuana, which uh, I don't know. That's 2016. So I guess this is an older one. Yeah, because uh, I, I, there's only four of them on the ballot this time, I think. But let me get to the California question, because I get asked it a lot. And look, if I was in, you know, the, the governor's office, I would do what the people wanted. But I, I, you know, I've been a, just so people know, I've been a former uh, war zone journalist, essentially for National Geographic, also for, did some coverage for the New York Times. I've seen some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, I've been to a lot of conflict zones. And um, I, it's very hard what people don't realize is when you talk about breaking off a state, it would almost inevitably mean as some type of civil war uh, and the loss of potentially billions and billions of dollars and lives and whatnot. I would not support the end of life unless we were really like there's a huge lack of freedom or something. And right now there doesn't seem to be a giant lack of freedom in California um, to break off into pieces. That said, if the people voted it, I would do the best to follow through with that. But as a philosophical concept, I think we, we need to do um, is to change Washington and to change the state and to change the Democrats from being so left-leaning and get them thinking more liberty rather than break off into multiple uh, parts. Right. So, well, I guess the, the main reason um, this kind of came about was you have, I mean, you have Los Angeles, which is just like this massive like city of, of, of celebrities and movie studios. And then you have, you actually have like, you know, smaller, um, I mean, the wine country is really technically farmland. And you, you've got other types of, of uh, farms out there. Um, so I, I think from what I understood, um, you've got a divide of the people in Los Angeles wanting to create these laws. And, and then, I mean, Sacramento is probably a whole nother beast, but they're, they're kind of completely different regions and they all want to create laws differently. So I, I guess what would be... Um, I, it, it's it's because like people have this emotional attachment to things right we don't want to like there's the shape of california and there's the flag with the bear on it and if you had to break it up into seven states like no i want the flag every state's going to be fighting over which which segment gets the flag with the bear on it and now right. you have to like change the shape of the of the california banana on on like everything um so it might even be more of that but but if everybody could agree that hey um, you know, the, the people in wine country say, oh, <laughs> that one was odd. The people in wine country can say, hey, I want nothing to do with, with Hollywood. And ho the people in Hollywood can say the same thing and everyone can kind of agree on it. Um, then I guess, I guess, well, I guess that's kind of what you're saying. If, if everyone kind of agreed to it, then it would be. Sure. And, and I, I, to be honest, I answered the other question, which is because I've been dealing a lot with the Jeffersonians up in northern no, NorCal or Northern California, and they want to split California off as its own nation. But of course, mm. there's other different things where people want to split into various parts. And, you know, that makes more sense. But again, you know, this idea that we're going to go through that and everyone's going to agree on everything is, is, 
I, I just think in the end of the day, it might just be easier to try to stick with what we have and to make internal adjustments. And um, because the numbers right now aren't really showing that California is willing to do that. There's a huge amount of benefits from California being one giant cohesive state. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's also some issues and you, people bring up very good points saying, well, how does wine farm, country farmland deal with the city of LA and Hollywood? They're completely different kind of uh, sides of the coin, I would say. But the point of the story is that I think this is just something that we like to talk about because we're all so pissed off about the state of California. But separating or breaking apart or changing these things is not really the, the, uh, the answer. The, the answer is really simple. The answer is lower taxes, streamline the government. People got to work for a living and, and, and earn their keep and, um, and a lot less uh, socialism. That, that's really the answer for California. And if California just did even a little bit of that, you would see the state improve a lot. It'd be a lot less talk of this, this breaking up or becoming different parts. Okay. Um, let me, I, I'm, I, I want to go back to this prop 64 and I, I can't see anything on it other than marijuana. So, uh, let's, <laughs> it's California. Let's talk about marijuana. What's, um, sure. Uh, and, and I have a, a very unique position that has upset <laughs> some libertarians. <laughs> I, I wrote about it for reason magazine, but it's been a central point of my, um, talk. And I'll, I'll just be honest with you. This is the 25th year anniversary of me being put in jail and convicted of two felonies for dealing marijuana when I was 18 years old, little bits of marijuana, like $40 worth. And I wrote an article for a reason recently saying I support reparations. I simply think that the government confiscated my car, confiscated my motorcycle, confiscated my money. Uh, I got all these other different issues that happened to go to court, uh, a month in jail, all this other stuff when I was 18 years old. And um, that was a real scar on my life, especially for me later, who went on to do, I think, pretty well. There are millions of us in California. Literally, there are millions of minor drug offenders in California that have had their shit taken because the government thought marijuana was you know, a terrible thing. I support just you know, complete decriminalization of all drugs. Doesn't matter what the drug is, I support decriminalizing it. Uh, Portugal's done it and Portugal's had some good success. But at the very least, thankfully, California is now, you know, at least allows marijuana. But I think the millions of people in California and the tens of millions of people in across the states deserve some type of reparation from the government for that kind of heinous and, um, you know, in my, in my opinion, despicable act for 20, 30, 40 years of making marijuana and putting people in jail, you know, for, for having a joint. It's, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. It, it very much, uh, it's very much a reason I'm a libertarian is because of this incident when I was 18. Right. And that's, that's really interesting because a lot of the libertarians that I've come across, um, you know, it's, I, so, so I've had my run-ins with the police too. And, and it's, it's really fascinating to me that most of the people who become very strong activist libertarians have, they all have this, like, you know, they've, they've got into a, they butted heads with the government at some point. Um, and I, I think it's really got a lot to do with, with, you know, the government's got good PR. They make themselves look wonderful until you actually have some sort of confrontation with them. And then you realize, hey, I'm not such a bad person, but these guys are really trying to screw me over. So, of um, course. yeah, no, and it, it, it takes something like that, something when I was young, I was scared. I, I, I never, you know, I, I was a pretty normal, nice guy. And here I am behind bars for literally something that I couldn't even imagine, you know, and I, going yeah. to jail for. And um, and that's and California. Then, like, I don't I don't know anybody who didn't sell weed in California at some point. Well, <laughs> to be fair, I was uh, I was doing a semester in Idaho for snowboarding. So it was in Idaho because California maybe would have been different. But um, it was still two felonies. And um, I had them expunged like 10, 15 years ago. But wow, it followed me around to airports. Every time I got a speeding ticket, it came up. It was, uh, you know, girlfriends hated it when they found out. You know, I mean, it was a bummer. And um, I'm, I'm certain that over the next 25 years of my life, I will pester the government until something is done to restore my Jeep Comanche they took, my motorcycle they took, and the amount of money. If I had saved the $20,000 on court costs when I was 18 years old and put it in the stock market, I would have had $100,000 at least. You know, I mean, and they have been doing this 
to literally 25 million Americans, I mean, a huge amount of Americans have gone through the system for nonviolent offenses that have cost them, and the government makes a huge amount of money off it. it it's a travesty. And I think something should finally be done about it where, you know, the government has to pay up if they're going to do it. You know, the problem, though, of course, is that the paying up comes from other taxpayers. Right. Uh, and, that, and that's the big dilemma. But, you know, in the meantime, it's not enough that they're talking about legalizing marijuana across the country right now. I, I'm serious about saying I think reparations are needed for those whose lives have been dramatically affected by a, a very stupid and, and ignorant decision on, you know, a bunch of people have thought marijuana was some kind of evil drug. It's not. Right. Never and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think you're so you're absolutely right that that, you know, first, like we should we should stop what we're doing. But I, I think as far as reparations, you know, as you mentioned, you, ha you got to take that from someone else. And we see the same thing like whenever um, when, when there's an officer involved in a shooting and someone sues the, the police department and they win. Like the police officer always gets to keep his job, he gets to keep his money, he doesn't have to pay anything, and it's it always comes out of the pockets of the taxpayer. And the big reason for you know, it's like if if you sue McDonald's because um, they spilled hot coffee on you, or, or you know, um, there's millions of dollars to take because that's a profitable business and they're making money that you know they've earned that money because people have given it to them. But here we're talking about the government who's who's earned their money from stealing it from people. Um, and and whenever you know, whenever you declare that there's going to be some sort of, of repayment or reparations or anything, now they have to go out and steal more from people in order to get that money. It's not like they have a job that they can just you know. The, all the politicians are going to have to go out and, and do some job, with, especially if they're replaced with automation. Um, well, and and my main suggestion though of reparations is that okay, you don't have to pay me, but I tell you what, reduce my taxes by fifty percent for the next twenty years. And I'll call, consider it a fair deal. And uh, that, that was my little twist with them. That's fair. Um, I, I could get behind that. So, so if we're going to start gradually cutting back taxes for everybody, the people who, are, who have been robbed by the government are the first ones to get their cut. I think that's, that's pretty fair. And, you know, it's been interesting when I've talked to a lot of people about in California on the campaign trail, a lot of people are like, wow, I like it. I like it. And the reason is, is because in San Francisco, about one third, it seems, of everyone out there has had some type of run in with the law for pot or something like that. And it was such a hassle and it caused all this grief in the family. Of course, it all happened when people are young. So I think um, there's a movement afoot at some point with this kind of idea. And we'll see. We'll see if it goes. But anyways, that's how I feel about about marijuana is and, and all drugs. I, I feel very strongly about decriminalizing all drugs end the war on drugs, total, total, you know, cuckoo plan from the start. And if we're going to spend any money from the government, let's spend it on rehabilitation, not on prosecuting people with drugs. Right. Yep. I'm, I'm totally up for that. Um, so uh, I guess is there, well, so give me a little bit of info here. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about you, uh, your website, where can they get one of those cool shirts? Uh, <laughs> um well, you can get the cool shirt off Amazon, but my website is ZoltanEastman.com, and um, I'm on all the social media, and if you just want to Google, you, Google I've written, I think, 17 articles um, during the last 18 months regarding kind of policy positions and interesting ideas, and all, over, all across the map, from the American Conservative to uh, Daily Dot to Reason, so you can Google any of that. And um, yeah, if you're in California, voting is, um, uh, I think, next Tuesday, and uh, yeah, um, Check off the Zoltan box if you go in. It is, uh, you said it's the 5th? Yes, it's June 5th. Okay, yeah, that's next Tuesday. Um, so, all right, and, and so that is the primary. So, so the way that one works is whoever gets the top two, uh, the, the top two most voted candidates go on to the primary, whatever party they're from. Uh, so uh, just go tell all your friends <laughs> to vote for a libertarian, vote for Zoltan. Um, and uh, don't vote for, vote for either the Democrats or the Republicans, of course, because nobody likes them. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, awesome. But you know what? I wanted to ask you something else, because like, what's your what's your background as far as technology? So you know, I'm a, I'm a philosophy major, and I don't actually have a any technology background whatsoever. But I'm just somebody who's been in love with science and technology my whole life, and. Um, uh, I guess what happened is right out of school, um, I went to work at National Geographic 
and began covering a lot of radical issues and radical conflict zones. And I had so many close calls that I uh, became attracted to this movement, transhumanism, where people are trying to overcome death through science and technology. And at some point, I wrote a novel, and I haven't talked about this, but when people want to know more about me, I, I wrote one of the best-selling libertarian novels of this century called The Transhumanist Wager. And um, it's, uh, it's still doing very well. It's being taught in colleges and high schools and everywhere else now. And um, it's really about a man who wants to try to live forever or, or at least overcome death through science. I don't know about living forever. And um, it's really my background is, is as a journalist who's super, I guess, infatuated with radical science and technology and what it can be, what, how we can help the human race become a better species rather than dying from cancer or dying from heart disease or getting Alzheimer's when we're 70 or 80. Awesome. That sounds like an interesting book. I might go pick one of those up. Yes, yes, please do. It's a, a lot of people, you know, it, it, it's highly, it's almost militant libertarian. And so it's gotten me in a lot of trouble for that. It's essentially, they, the people get kicked out of America, all the scientists, and they build a big giant seasteading platform where they can do all their science and all their technology unhindered by the government. And I'm a volunteer ambassador at the Seasteading Institute, which is also one of the largest organizations for seasteading. So um, I, I have a, it's, it's a great libertarian idea to kind of leave your country and go form something new where nobody can bother you. And you can do your research and your science undisturbed. It, in America, you can't do that, man. There's so many laws with science, so many regulations. It makes it almost impossible to get a simple pacemaker through the system so that one somebody can use it. Right. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of trying to say... And I mean, like we, we I don't know, I, I've always heard stories about, you know, yeah, you get on a boat, like a, even a cruise ship, you go off into international waters and then you can gamble legally. Um, it is So I, I've seen some of these things where like people are trying to build these islands that's like a whole city and you, like the island floats around the world and all this. Is, is any of that stuff actually happening? Like I, I know a lot of it's been kind of disappeared. There, there, it, there, it finally is happening. The problem is still getting jurisdiction because some most people don't want to have it just floating around. There are a couple floating around science centers now. And um, even like I think Peter Thiel recently took some of his more radical science experiments to some Central American country to do it there. And some people are trying to do it off reefs, on reefs, because the same rules don't apply to, you know, every, every little country in, in, is different. But yeah, essentially, once you're outside 200 miles, um, you become in what we call an international waters where there's it's not regulated by anything like that. And um, so people are always looking at that. The Sea Setting Institute has one plan that they're working on with funding, you know, but again, it's probably a 10 to 15 year build out before you would say, oh, I can go visit this place. But still, it's it's the dream and it's it is happening. Yeah. And it's fast and and you know, like two years ago. Everyone thought self-driving cars were a fantasy, and we're starting to see that now. So, <laughs> totally, it's, it's it's interesting. All right, Zoltan, it's been awesome talking with you. Um, good luck uh, next week with the election, and um, maybe we'll have you on again and and see where you go. Um, you know, whatever happens with the election, if you go on to, to keep running um, in the in the uh, general election, or whether oh, <laughs> whether you find something else to do um, to to keep activism going, it'd be interesting to to kind of follow your story. So. Hopefully we'll talk again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Hey, uh, what is taxation? Well, it's fast. All right. It works for me. I'll catch you later. <laughs> Take care.